these are pictures from Flickr. These people said that they cut back their entire backyard and two weeks before this happened, and then they went out and took this picture because it had basically grown over their house again. Um, so let's talk about CSS kudzu. Um, this is a slide that um, Cheng Hao and David Wei presented at uh, Velocity Conference last year. How many people have heard of Velocity Conference? Okay, a few. So it's all about performance and how to make stuff fast. Lots of interesting stuff happening there. And one more time, can everyone hear me? Am I holding it close enough? Yeah, okay, great. Um, so this number on the slides stuck out to me like a sore thumb. 1.9 megabytes of CSS. I was like, oh my god. And then uh, about a week later, I got a call to go and consult with Facebook and try to get the size of the CSS down from this sort of colossal figure. Um, and it might seem crazy. You might be thinking like 1.9 megs, how does that happen? You would be shocked. Um, I've been on multiple projects where they call me in when they start measuring their, their CSS in megabytes rather than in KB. And granted, that isn't all being delivered on one page. You can see the home page is actually only getting about 64. But that doesn't make a difference because if over the course of the site you're pulling in all this CSS little by little, you're actually slowing down every single interaction the user has with the site um, rather than just one big initial uh, slowdown. So yeah. That was my reaction, 1.9 megabytes. That's definitely some CSS kinds of uh, But there are things that we can do about it. Um, and the first step is object-oriented CSS. That's, that's sort of my way of having an architecture, having a structure, and having abstractions within the CSS environment. How many people have already heard something about OOCSS? Awesome, I'm so glad I eliminated the more basic slots. <laughs> Great. Um, so, a little bit. It's more like an evolution of the language. Um, it makes CSS more powerful. And it's all about sort of focusing on what's happening, um, not between the curly braces. That's where we've gotten things figured out. We more or less know how to create cross-browser tags or whatever else. We know how to do that now. Um, OOCSS says, what are we doing here? What are we doing uh, with our selector strings? That's where the architecture lives in CSS. And so if we get that right, we'll sort of head off the kudzu before it completely grows in. So what does OOCSS mean? The first thing is it means much, much, much less code. Um, it's startling how much less code you need to do the same thing when you start building it this way. Um, and Tom, I think you can attest to that. Uh, Tom works at Facebook and talked a little earlier. Uh, but about how big a change it makes with just some relatively small changes in the way you approach your development. Um, Another thing is it's easier to work with newbies. Um, super, super simple. This example I have up here is about creating a rounded corner box. <coughs> How many rules does it take? One. That's because all of the architecture has already been abstracted out. Creating a new rounded corner box once you have one is dead, dead simple. That means you can have somebody come onto your team who doesn't necessarily know what they're doing, or you can have, say, a lot of teams have a kind of split with people who are really focused on CSS and that's their primary expertise, and then people who are more sort of programmery who'd really rather not touch it, but there just aren't enough of the CSS people. Um, so if you have the more programmer people touch your CSS, it gets really easy when it looks like this. When you tell them to create a rounded corner box and all they have to do is have one line of code. Um, but don't, you know, don't take my word for it. Wow. Is the podium in the way of you guys seeing the well, there's not a lot I can do about that, so I'll tell you what it says. <laughs> um, so don't take my word for it. Look at the code from the, my open source project. It's all available, all the code is available on GitHub. Um, this is the template file. Um, so this is roughly what it does. It creates left and right columns, as many of them as you want, header, body, footer. Basic stuff, it can do flexible or fixed width layouts, um, but it's 807 bytes and 13 lines of code to do all those different layouts, kind of Gmail style layout, a Yahoo layout, a bunch of different ones, as well as being really easy to expand to whatever size columns you need or however many columns you need or don't need. Um, the grids as well, they're tiny, tiny, tiny. This is my favorite part, and I know I shouldn't say nice things about my own code, but I really like how the grids have turned out. I've gotten some awesome feedback from um, other people in the open source project, and we made them like far, far better. So it's about 600 bytes. 14 lines of code. You get all the different divisions that you want between halves uh, and fifths, so uh, fifths, fourths, thirds, and halves. And they're infinitely nestable and stackable. 
That's really important because you may well divide your page into one fifth and four fifths, but what happens if within the four fifths you need uh, to divide it in thirds and have three rounded corner boxes next to each other? A grid system that doesn't allow you to infinitely nest and stack is basically only solving one level of your problems, and it isn't allowing you to um, create the future things that you haven't imagined yourself building yet. So as I've been talking about OOCSS this year, the first question I've been getting when somebody stands up is, OOCSS sounds great, there's no way it's gonna work for us, we have a total mess, there's no way we can get from here to there. Um, it's hard. It's, I'm not going to tell you it's easy if you have CSS Kudzu, getting from there to a, a more structured architectural approach is difficult, like it would be in any code. You know, if your PHP is a total mess, it takes a lot of work to get back uh, to something good. Um, it's the same thing here, but that does, doesn't mean it's impossible. Um, feel free to ask questions, by the way, while I'm going along, if you guys think of something and you have anything uh, that I don't explain exactly. Okay, so to get rid of CSS kudzu, it, you actually have to understand that, uh, like kudzu itself, CSS kudzu comes in different varieties. They're, depending on what exact problem you have, you need a different solution. Um, so the first step is always just to figure out what kind of difficulty you're, you're struggling with. They're all tied in together, they're not completely independent, but the different kinds of problems lead to a need for different sorts of solutions. Um, then you want to build CSS components, starting with the tiniest little ones, lists, headings, really the basics of what your pages are built out of. Um, and only once you've got a, a solid library of CSS components do you want to start um, um, changing your templates. Because you need to get your Legos right before you can sort of move on to, uh, um, to changing the templates themselves. And then once you're doing the templates, you can change the more complex of objects. This is the, this is the path that I, that I followed while I was at Facebook, more or less. Obviously, there were deviations here and there where we needed to solve individual problems. But this is roughly uh, what I did while I was there. And then you have to make it stick. And this is one of the hardest parts. But sometimes our best practices and our, our ideas for how we want to do development are actually causing us to get more CSS kudzu. Um, in Facebook's case, some of their um, some of their coding standards that that their um, their code tool when you would you'd commit code, um, it would complain about a few things. Um, but if you did it the way the tool said you should do it, you would actually end up with more kudzu. Um, so that's the kind of thing where you have to kind of build it into your processes as well, so that it uh, helps people to build the right code later. And they've done a fantastic job of sort of continuing on with that. Okay, so today. I'm uh, diagnosis, how to figure out what's wrong, because it's sort of the more geeky, more interesting part. Um, the other parts, there's a lot of process in it, and it is important too, but, um, but the diagnosis is kind of fun. This is the rough equation that I came up with. Uh, architecture fail, plus stale rules, plus unpredictability, plus duplication, and plus specificity wars equals massive CSS. You don't even have to have all of these, if you have a few of them, you've got uh, massive CSS most likely, or you will have. So first up, architecture fail. Um, basically, completely missing abstractions. Typically CSS has been you know, written more by the design community than it has by programmers, and so we didn't even think necessarily that we should have abstractions. It was uh, kind of um, organic. It sort of grew very much like Kudzu, right? It, it kind of grew on its own, and there was no sort of sense of, of architecture. Um, when I first started at Facebook, I met uh, an engineer who had a Lego Death Star uh, on his desk, and I immediately fell into a deep geek crush. <laughs> and then um, I thought about Legos, and I thought about how it related to what we were doing. Um, the cool thing about Legos is that with some really simple pieces, some basic building blocks, um, you can build all kinds of different things. So if what you're into is cars, you can build a car. Uh, Lego Einstein, how about that? Um, this guy's really, he's actually building art with Legos. Um, so this guy's apparently lost his arm. He also built this one, which is sort of how I feel when I see 1.9 megabytes of CSS. Um, so we want to do the same sort of thing with CSS. It's the same approach. 
we're trying to create these building blocks, uh, these basic chunks of code of HTML and CSS.